and gents, welcome back to another episode of Abe Thompson and other disappointments. Uh, what's going on? What's the uh, what's the happy haps? You sexy tinkers. Uh, we've got a hell of a show for you tonight. Uh, we've got Donald Trump. What's he been up to? He's been floating himself on the stock market. Don't know if you saw that. Uh, we've had more Tory resignations. We've got P. Diddy. Very famous American rapper and producer. He's getting his houses, plural, raided. This is after the feds have looked at his phone. There's a sex trafficking stuff going on. It's wild. <laughs> uh, what else is going on? Lawrence Fox has been in the news again. We're going to try and get through it all. Uh, that we are slightly inhibited by time. And, uh, and, and my patience. Um... And of course, the uh, the constant temptation to just sigh at the news, throw in the towel, swallow a load of painkillers, and just finally be at peace, dear listeners. From all of this, all of the noise and the chaos, would just be amazing, wouldn't it? I mean, I'm joking, guys. I'm I'm joking. I'm I'm mostly joking. Um, I mean, do you ever do you ever look around at the news, current affairs, constant developments? I mean, you look back at yourself, you know, and you think, God, you know, I don't see any of my friends from back in the day anymore. You know, all I do is work now, and taxes are going up, and the value of money is going down. And the middle class are just dying. You know, we'll probably be living in a neo-Victorian nightmare within the next 10 or 20 years. And that's if we survive nuclear war and climate change. Like, do you ever mathematically weigh that all up and just go, it may even be the net positive outcome, Aid. If, if you just, you know, off yourself. <laughs> like, it could just be maths at this point. How are you going to argue with maths, guys? It's sometimes how I, you know, catch myself thinking. If I just ended it all. You know, like my kids would cry. Obviously, they'd be a bit sad. But then they would kind of get over it, I think. Wouldn't they? Then they would, um, you know, then they would get... So, and here's, here's when you get really dark about it, guys. This is when you, you really catch yourself going down a bit of a dark rabbit hole is you think what if the mournful traumatized incarnation of my son right just picture him for a minute the traumatized mournful one devastated by his father's death early in his life what if that version goes on to be more successful you know <laughs> because it forces him to work harder or whatever, you know, it, it makes him more compassionate as well because his father was never around for him and he knows how that feels, etc, etc. What if that version of my son is just better than the version when I stick around, right? The version where I raise him to just basically be another me. <laughs> He's like raised up into adulthood by me, like, and he goes on to self-loathe. You know, just like I kind of do. Anyway, like then the maths kicks in and you just, you know, you honestly think, I like the first version better, right? So wouldn't it be better if, you know, <laughs> if I just checked out? <laughs> it's, it's mathematically what you sometimes find yourself weighing up in your head. Like, I'm sorry to bum you out this early on in the show. This is normally about 17, 20 minutes in we get to this level of... Uh, but yeah, and, and, like I could totally imagine the exchange, right? It, like imagine I did kill myself. Imagine then I'm in heaven, hopefully, aspirationally, I'm up in heaven. And then my son tries to communicate with me through a Ouija board. <laughs> and he's like, why did you leave, dad? Why, why did you leave? Didn't you love us enough? Why did you leave us? And I'll be like, you've you got it all twisted. You got it back to front. Um, I left because i love you <laughs> growing up fatherless produced the optimal version of you like look at you look at the albums you've produced here jacob 
You know, he'd end up all like Eminem y and like Kurt Cobain y. <laughs> Tormented, aggrieved. I'd be like, look at you. And yes, you're welcome. Um, I mean, it reminds me now, now I'm thinking about it, you know, it reminds me of that, um, that series. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember it. Uh, the Rock, Dwayne Johnson, right? He was in a series, a sort of comedy drama thing uh, you, a few years ago. And it was one where he was a sports agent. And like he was he was this ex-American football player who got injured and then he you know, couldn't play anymore. So then he decided to become an agent slash fixer kind of guy instead. And anyway, one of the players in this team uh, goes on to meet his sort of, you know, his erstwhile father. And this guy is a deadbeat, you know, and he's only back in the picture to try and get money out of his now quite successful American footballer kid. You know, it's, it's a proper piece of, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and anyway, the, the kid and the father have this sit down lunch or, you know, coffee or whatever. And uh, and the father is like, He's like, well, it's good to see my plan worked. <laughs> the kid is still like angry, you know, bitter because his dad ran out on him and his mom and all that. He's like, uh, so he's like, it's good to see my plan worked. And the kid's like, what? <laughs> he's like, so shameless about it. He's like, well, you know, because I ran out on your mom and you, <laughs> it hardened you and it made you want to build a better life for yourself put in the work and that that is why you're amazing that's why you're so successful and rich oh my god you're so rich like could you cut me a check please please can i get some money like the shameless grift of it it's like and anyway like the, the kid is like uh, like i'm i'm not me because of you i'm me in spite of you <laughs> so anyway yeah i don't know why that's uh popped in my head you know oh yeah that's right like, would my son be better off if I just wasn't here is a thought that seriously sometimes inhabits my head. Um, anyway, let's actually talk about some politics, shall we? Let's get into it, guys. Because uh, we've got London being declared a war zone by the Tories. I don't know if you saw that yesterday. Uh, we've got Lawrence Fox launching into a tirade about his ex-wife, seemingly. Uh, we've got Donald Trump. We've got those Tory resignations, guys. Where do we start? Should we go in on Lawrence Fox first? Um, or is there something more? Yeah, script. Let's just let, let's just jump straight in, shall we? With all the enthusiasm of a cat on a diving board. Here we go. So, Lawrence Fox of libeling people as paedophiles and getting sued for that uh, fame uh, and concurrently of suing other people I think for libel or maybe it was defamation for calling him racist and losing both of those cases fame I mean really it's it's a resounding success for his bad law project if ever you needed one <laughs> I think uh, Lawrence Fox of failed actor failed musician Failed mayoral candidate, failed husband, of all of that uh, infamy, if you like. Well, he has taken to Twitter uh, once again. It's not going to shock anybody. Um, but this time he's, he's taken to Twitter or X uh, to share these thoughts. And I am going to read them out first, obviously. Um, but I just want to give you a tiny bit of context beforehand. Okay, because, you know, just a, a tiny bit. Of context because a i don't think you'll fully understand the ridiculousness of it unless i do you know tiny bit of context but also b if i do just give you a tiny bit of context i mean lawrence fox is probably more sensical when taken out of context so a tiny bit of context feels about the, the right amount i think for a lawrence fox segment you know, like you add in some context and that's where it gets confusing, I think, with Lawrence Fox. You know, that in, in that instance, you're like, wait, 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 hang on. What? Why? Why would he say? Why would he say that about a Ava Evans? Like, what, what does that have to do with? with anyway, so. Uh, so he goes on Twitter um, yesterday and he says this in a now deleted post. He says, this is what a very wealthy woman 
is asking a court for me to pay to her tomorrow. He says, no men have this platform. It is the last bit of everything I saved. I paid £16,000 to see my boys last month. 16 grand, guys. That is a lot. I mean, here's, here's what I hope is true, right, with this. <laughs> I, hope that, I hope that even his sons hate him. <laughs> I hope that even his kids see him on the news and they follow him on X and they're like, oh, no, dad, dad, rain it in. <clears throat> and then when he's like, can I see you next weekend? Can I see you like on the 24th or whatever? They're like, oh, they look at each other. They're like, do you like dad? No. Do you? No, me either. How can we how can we square this a little bit? How do we make money? If he, if dad wants to see us, mum, mum, if dad wants to see us, eight grand each. Yeah. <laughs> Tell him to make the drop. Or he's never going to see his kids again. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so he says, yeah, look, this is what a very wealthy woman is asking a court for me to pay to her tomorrow. No men have this platform. He says, it is the last of everything that I saved. I paid 16 grand to see my boys last month. He says, I cannot pay 47,000 pounds this month and a bill that I cannot talk about because family court. He says, but I will, because that is the only reason I speak for those that can't <laughs> and and i'm reading this tweet right and and obviously a lot of different bits stick out for different reasons but like one of the first bits that sticks out or like caught my attention was the fact that he said he's dead like he can't pay the forty-seven thousand pounds because this is the last of everything he's saved okay 47 grand that's the last of it guys and I think it's important to emphasize here that Lawrence Fox comes from a family dynasty of actors and producers and talent agents and so on and so on. Right. Like he went to private school. He went to RADA after that. He starred in Lewis on ITV. He starred in White Lines on Sky. So whether it is inherited wealth or wealth that he has accumulated, he must have been fairly comfortable, one would have thought. And so for him to be taken down to his last £47,000 suggests to me that he has been hit with enormous expenses. Enormous! He's like, it's the last bit of everything I saved. That's what he said. Yeah, everything after you got sued for running your mouth off. You moron. He says, I paid 16 grand to see my boys last month. I cannot pay 47 grand this month. And also this other bill that I can't talk about because family court. But I will because that is the only reason I speak for those that can't. God, he's so selfless, isn't he? He's just, you know, the only reason that he speaks is for those who can't. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to kick a man while he's down to his last <laughs> 47,000 pounds, clearly. But when you're saying the only reason I speak is for those who can't, I imagine a lecture theatre full of people suffering from mutism, <laughs> breaking the code to each one after the other, tell him to shut the fuck up. <laughs> That's what goes through my mind when he says i speak for those who don't have a voice everyone with a voice would just be like keep it down a bit though please maybe have a time out larry you know give yourself a day off you've earned it um and then then he says and this is interesting um, he says, to all those brave women who snort cocaine whilst berating the patriarchy, perhaps lay off the blow and know there are kids involved and they need both parents. Make junkies despised again. Right? <laughs> do, do I need to reread that to you guys? He says, to all those brave women who snort cocaine while berating the patriarchy, 
Perhaps lay off the blow and know there are kids involved and they need both parents. Make junkies despised again. Which is like... Like, is he calling Billy Piper a cokehead? Is that what he's calling her? Is he referring to Billy Piper there? Because it seems pretty, you know. Or is he, like, is he just carefully cloaking it, like, just enough that he doesn't get sued? You know, like, cloaking it with a, um, you know, this is to all women out there who do this. You know, but not necessarily her. I mean, that's open to interpretation. It's not my fault if her face went into your head. You know, even though the premise of this now deleted uh, tweet is a post, you know, fairly clearly, candidly criticizing his ex-wife, right? And her demand for the 47,000 pounds. Like, I don't know if that would hold up libel-wise. Would that hold up? Is he going to get sued again? You know, because I reckon, I reckon they would look at that, right? Like a defamation lawyer, a libel lawyer. I reckon they would look at that and they would go like, well, you start off the post by citing a wealthy woman, don't you? And the context of the piece is about child support. <laughs> a reader of this piece would comfortably be left with the impression that you are calling your ex-wife a junkie, Mr. Fox. And then he would, I guarantee he would immediately clap back and be like, well, you know, it's, uh, just, what about free speech? Again, and the magistrate, I, I I would love to see this if a magistrate just gave him a proper dress and get down. Like, and they were like, oh, God, how many times do we have to go through this, Larry? Are you seriously going to rock up here once a year on a libel charge, taking one seminar every 12 months from us into what is free speech and what is libel and defamation? Like, it would honestly, Larry, listen to me very clearly in my last magistrate statement. Like, I know tuition fees are super high now, but it would still, it would be cheaper for you to learn this stuff in university than constantly be getting sued and gradually have it sink into your brain court case after court case. I promise you. Um, but anyway, a lot of this brings me back to uh, my Labour social cohort, uh, Graham Hughes, uh, and a tweet that he posted uh, a few months back. I, I don't know if you guys remember um, when Lawrence Fox was trying to claim that having been called racist, uh, was it the racism trial or was it the other one? I can't remember, but he, he, I think he was trying to claim that he was being lined up for these top tier Hollywood roles, right? <laughs> and that this specific allegation, whatever it was, had cost him those roles. I remember ranting about it on a, on a podcast episode. Like, are you sure it's not just the fact that you come off as a bit of a, you know, whatever? Um, but yeah, there was this one report that, you know, he's being teed up for James Bond in his mind. He thought he was going to go for a James Bond role or something. And then there was another one about Batman. I think like a role in Batman he thought that he was up for. I don't know if he ever thought he would actually be personally Batman, right? That seems a bit detached, even for Lawrence Fox. But I remember when all of that came out, right? Get back to the point, Aid. Um, I remember when all of that came out, th those news stories that he said, I, you know, before this allegation, I was getting all of these roles and it's cost me my career, etc. Um, when all of that stuff surfaced, uh, I remember Graham posting a tweet. He was like, the only time he's ever getting in a Batman suit will be to abseil down the Houses of Parliament demanding to see his kids. That's like, <laughs> and now, now where are we? Guys, you see, this is why we say it's the satirists I feel sorry for sort of thing, you know, because that was a joke a couple of months ago. And now where are we? We are about 100 meters of rope and a utility belt away from that actually happening. Anyway, finally on this, don't want to spend the whole episode talking about Lawrence Fox, do we? Uh, finally on this, um, I, look, I'll just say this, right? That if Billy Piper was partial to a bit of the old cheeky, right? If she were bang on the check, can we just pause for a moment to just enjoy the reality of this, right? Which is ostensibly that Billy Piper as a cokehead is still 
way more likeable and popular than Lawrence Fox sober, which is really quite an achievement. Like most people I know who have done drugs or who have been around people who have done drugs will know that if you've had a gram or two of coke, you could be obnoxious, you could be arrogant, you could be quite selfish, you might be rude. Like imagine how bad you would feel about yourself if you were all of those things sober to a worse degree than your cokehead wife. Like, I mean, like... I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying that is what's happened here, right? I don't know what's happened or what they get up to in their spare time, but I'm just saying that if that were the case, it'd probably make you feel bad, wouldn't it? I mean, you might almost think if it, if it really made you feel bad, it might almost make you think that it might be a mathematical net positive for everyone concerned if you just, you know, <laughs> if you just no, 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 you can't say that. We can't, let's not go down that road, eh? That is too dark. Let's just, let's, let's move on to the next thing, shall we? Um, I, I don't know, man. I mean, like, for me, it's just, it's the lack of self-awareness, right? And the lack of responsibility that gets me. It's like, like, I'm a parent, right? So let me just explain why this doesn't make much sense to me like he's complaining that he can't afford the maintenance i assume is this what this is right which is presumably built up over time to forty-seven thousand pounds right but i'm guessing the figures right the original figures of the settlement the maintenance agreement or whatever i'm guessing the figures that contributed to that debt and now court demand i'm guessing they were established when they originally got divorced, right? Which was in 2016. And that was a while before he started his descent on question time by completely dismissing the idea of white privilege. Do you remember that? That's when it all started to go wrong. And when the rolls dried up <laughs> many moons ago. But here he is now in 2024 and he's thinking, this isn't fair, you know, this isn't, it's not reasonable. Well, shouldn't you have considered the libel stuff, you know, and how it might impact your maintenance payments? Like, why did that not, you know, like it's such a clear trajectory to me when we're talking about responsibility and parenthood. You know, it's like he's such a free speech advocate, but... Shouldn't it be like, okay, well, look, I, I think everyone should be able to say whatever they like. Uh, free speech and all that. I'm a free speech ultra and encourages debate and everything. But, okay, if I say these things and somebody sues me and I don't back down <laughs> or offer to settle or just apologize, if they sue me, I'm going to lose all this money, right? <laughs> How might that impact my financial responsibilities, I might be thinking? Could that adversely affect my relationship with my children, I might be thinking? And indeed, could it affect their welfare on a purely nuts and bolts level? These are the thoughts that have never inhabited Lawrence Fox's brain. Seemingly. I mean, maybe, like, maybe Lawrence Fox should do drugs. <laughs> maybe, like... Larry, if you're watching, maybe you should do some drugs. Is uh, Make junkies despised again. How about you try doing some drugs? Let it expand your mind a little bit. And who knows? You might get some of this forethought and consideration that I'm talking about. Um, anyway, right. Let's, let's actually move on now. Let's talk a little bit about Rishi Sunak, shall we? Uh, Rishi Sunak has had to do a little reshuffle. Guys, let's talk about that uh, for a moment. So this is from The Guardian, um, and they reported that Robert Halfen and James Heapy join an exodus of Tory MPs from the Commons as the party languishes in the polls. And uh, I should probably mention Scott Benton stepped down earlier in the week also, or was that last week now? Um, Scott Benton's gone. Huge loss uh, to the Blackpool South constituency i don't know if they'll ever get over it 
um, Scott Benton will step down. I mean, presumably he'll be back working, you know, front of house in a Betfair shop pretty soon. But um, anyway, all of this has meant Sunak has been forced to move the deck chairs around once again, hasn't he? That is always the metaphor that is wheeled out when a political project kind of falters, isn't it? Oh, he's, he's moving the deck chairs around on the on board the Titanic. And um, uh, anyway, so how fun education minister is out. Heapy uh, armed forces minister is also out. Um, how fun, how fun is an interesting one, though, guys. I mean, he probably could have defected. I think, you know, like I was I was reading his Wikipedia page earlier and he's quite a weird fit for the Tories, you know, like he's pro union, uh, he's pro reducing the tax burden, but specifically on lower earners. He's a Remainer. Uh, he broke the whip to support a Labour opposition day for free school meals. Like, shouldn't you just switch teams, you know, <laughs> just switch teams, Robert. Especially when you're this, like, you know, Labour is suddenly eating into you. Just run across the floor. You'll still have a job in a few months. I mean, Lee Anderson's just done it, hasn't he? I mean, admittedly, he's run across to the to the wrong team and he will still be out of a job in a few months. But he's, I'm just saying, in, in terms of walking across the floor, it's it must be quite easy if Lee's managed it, Robert. I mean, you think Tory and Robert... You think of people like Robert Jenrick of painting over the children's Mickey Mouse mural fame, don't you? You hear Tory and Robert, you think of Jenrick doing dodgy deals for Richard Desmond the day before he would have been hit with a big tax bill. You don't necessarily think of a pro-union, Remainer, compassion -y kind of... Like, I don't want to be a prick about it, but... You know, um, you know, mo mostly because, like, maybe, maybe he's a sleeper agent. You know, that would kind of, right? Like, maybe he wears a blue rosette on election night, but actually, you know, we judge them by their actions, right? And he keeps voting with Labour on things. Like, maybe that's his deal. I don't know. Anyway, uh, he's out and uh, Heapy is out, education and defence, respectively. And a lot of people are wondering if this is the beginning of an exodus. You know, is it going to be a trickle, trickle, death by a thousand cuts kind of thing? You know, like, I, I hope that is the case. Like, are there not a few more Tory MPs who would rather exit now and have some grace and dignity you know, just step down now ahead of the personal expense of an election campaign, ahead of the stress, the long hours, the door knocking, the impact on your family, the almost guaranteed expectation of me pointing and laughing at you in the local sports centre at 1am when you haven't slept for three days and you're feeling super tired and super sensitive. Like, wouldn't that be the kicker, guys? You know, you're knackered, you're broke, you got no job now, you're tired, you just want to go to bed. Nothing went the way that you had hoped. And then, bam! <laughs> just when you're at your lowest ebb in that sports centre, you've come forth. You've lost your deposit money. Right at that moment, in I come with my phone and a mic laughing in your face and putting it straight onto TikTok. Wouldn't that just break your spirit, guys? But anyway, no, apparently, uh, is the answer. Uh, it seems there's no shortage of Tories who are still quite keen on going into battle, uh, which is actually quite encouraging, isn't it? You know, we're going to have some fun that night. Uh, you've got, you know, heavy hitters still. In, in the running, who seem to be actually in quite a risky place, polling-wise. You've got Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, who's put £100,000 of his own money into his re-election campaign. 
and that is despite polling pretty much neck and neck with the Liberal Democrats in his constituency. You've got Jonathan Gullis. You've got Ben Bradley. I mean, Hunt, Hunt, if we just go back to him for a minute, Hunt is actually quite a funny one, right? Because he's so like, he's so light speed detached, guys. He is not of this world. He's like, like he'll take a hundred grand out of his current account, right? And he'll dump it into the leafleting and door knocking budget. Like, yep, yeah, <clears throat> it's a... Here's the money. Yep, yeah, that's that's how the big boys roll, right? Just drops a wad of cash in there. And then the next minute, like a matter of hours later, he'll be on LBC talking about taxes and the cost of living. And he'll be like, yeah, well, £100,000 is actually not really uh, that, that much money. It's not a very high salary <laughs> at all. Well, OK, Jeremy. All right. I'm a little bit confused here, mate. If it's not that much money, why don't you drop another tonner on your re-election budget? I mean, you know, if you're polling neck and neck, you're at risk of losing your seat and 100 grand isn't that much money. Then put your money where your weirdly thin-lipped mouth is. You bet it. Oh, well, actually, I don't think 100 grand is, is that much money. Well, clearly not to you, Jezza. Clearly not to you, because you've just dropped 100k on a 50-50 chance on 27 red at the crab table. Big money hunt. Um, so, yeah, you see, see what I mean? Just weirdly detached, isn't he? You know, do you remember back when he was like health secretary for Theresa May? And he was like, you know, he just thought junior doctors would just, they would just get poorer and poorer. As time goes on, they just accept it, you know. Yeah, they don't I, don't. I don't think they'll mind. They just continuously, progressively get poorer and poorer and sink into poverty with huge medical debts. Like I remember back in the day, like when he, he was getting a lot of flack uh, from the left-leaning press, you know, the Mirror, Guardian, all over Twitter and stuff. Everyone was like, "Do you just expect these doctors to just continuously work into their graves?" They, you know, gradually their salaries are getting eaten, like they're not raising in line with inflation. You just expect them to get poorer, but still come into work. And, and you'd imagine him like sort of pushing back. Like, oh, yeah, that's that's what they're there for, aid. It's it's the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> oh, is it? Is it, Jezza? All oh, right. OK. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they all take this oath before they become doctors. Right. And then <laughs> this is the clever bit. Then their duty and honour bound to just keep coming to work to save lives and treat people. They've just got to put up with it forever. Oh, wow. I mean, that is that is a shrewd and sociopathic negotiating technique there, Jezza. I mean, Cripes, you, you are a clever one, aren't you? Why, yes. Yes, I am. It's the Hippocratic Oath, dear boy. It goes, um... It goes. Let me see if I can, if I, if I can remember. It, it, it goes. Um, as a, as a doctor and a carer and a compassionate human being, I vow, I pledge to heal the sick and button my moan hole. <laughs> that is it. it and then it's duty bound. Verbal contract. Sorry. See you later. Um. So yeah, Jeremy Hunt, weirdly detached. And do you know what? We see it even in his current role. You know, he moved into the Treasury. He's the Chancellor. He's so detached. Like, he will literally tell you. Like, he'll look at the UK economy nosediving into recession. And then he'll tell you with a straight face. We've, we've turned a corner. <laughs> but yeah, even even for him, right? This, this is this morning, right? He popped up on my feed. Uh, Jeremy Hunt. And, um... And he posts this, which is up on the screen now if you're watching on YouTube. But if, you, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple or whatever, you'll have to take my word for it. Um, so I, I saw that he'd, he was up bright and early. And this is him in his sports gear. There's sun in the background. And it says this, right? See, see what you make of it, right? It's <clears throat> like he's just woke up and he's going for this um, uh, 3K run or something. And it's in preparation for his charity run, which he's doing to raise money for a cancer ward, right? 
It says, uh, 20 miles today in three hours, 32 minutes. Part of my marathon training. Poppy managed the first part. Hyde Park looked glorious in the sunshine. I've just launched my Just Giving page. I'm hoping to raise lots of money for the new Royal Surrey Cancer Centre. Right? I, know. I wake up and I sit like, you know when you're bleary eyed and you're like, am I, am I, like, is this, am I imagining this? Is this still a dream? Have I not understood this because I'm still half a cent? But, or is this trolling now? You know? Because this feels like trolling to me, guys. It's like here, here you have the Chancellor, right? Literally the Chancellor of the Exchequer. A man with his hands on the purse strings of the UK economy, including healthcare, you know, the NHS funding, NHS maintenance, cancer ward and cancer care funding, budgeting. And bear in mind, the NHS is on its knees. His hands on the purse strings, right? NHS crumbling, people on waiting list. There's hospital staff just walking out because they can't deal with it anymore. It's like a war zone. People just turning up for work and go like, that's it. No, I'm done. This is not worth it. You've got hospital trusts just plummeting into the red financially. And this guy who has his hands on the levers that could free up some money, this guy... It's like, well, time to do something nice for the NHS, I suppose. <laughs> and like, I, I imagine somebody tearing into the treasury and being like, are, are you the chancellor? Are, are you Mr. Hunt? Right, I, I, I work in, um, I work in Surrey uh, Cancer uh, Treatment Re Recovery Centre. We're down to our last like fifty pounds. Like, we, we only have fifty pounds in in the in the current account for them, uh, and we can't afford to pay the cleaners. The radiotherapy suites haven't been cleaned in weeks. People are missing their chemo. But one guy, Jeremy, one, one guy came in with a lump and I told him it was a Veruca. I sent him away with a pumice stone and he never came back. Honestly, I don't know if it got worse and we just never saw him again or if it got better and I may have accidentally cured cancer with pu just pumice cure cancer. Anyway, we need more money, Jeremy. We need, we need funding. It's an emergency. You know, and he just like straps on his hand. He's like, all right, OK, I get it. I hear you. You need more money. And they're like, oh, my God, really? Are you going to are you seriously going to allocate more funding to the NHS? And he's like, well, you know, not quite. <laughs> Smash cut to him doing his charity fun run. He's like, here's here's my just giving page, guys. Make sure everyone knows that I'm doing this to give funding to the cancer treatment center so everyone knows that I'm a I'm a good guy who's just trying to give something back yeah meanwhile everyone with a brain is like you're you're the fucking chancellor <laughs> just give the hospitals the money they need ah <laughs> oh. anyway who's next on my list uh to talk about tonight uh Jonathan Gullis guys Jonathan Gullis, ex-teacher Jonathan Gullis, also popped up yesterday. He is now deputy chair of the Conservative Party. So that's fun, isn't it? Jonathan Gullis. Uh, he looks like a sort of um, half-shaved, permanently confused Bigfoot, doesn't he? He looks sort of, you know, confused, like he's... Like, I tell you the sort of vibe, right, that I get from Jonathan Gullis, right? I get the sort of vibe, the sort of facial expression, right? The confusion, the inner torment. I get the vibe that this is someone to whom, like, his ex-girlfriend really didn't want to break his heart. But she did want to break up with him, right? She's like, oh, I've got to get away from this moron. I don't want to break his heart. And so... She suggested that they play hide and seek, right? <laughs> and he was like, oh, oh, I love hide and seek, me. Oh, oh, it's my favorite. Oh, I've been waiting for you to suggest this. I'm like, oh, it's my favorite game ever. And she's like, uh-huh. <laughs> and then she told him that she's going to go and hide and that he should cover his eyes and count to 10. And in those 10 seconds, she just grabbed her suitcase and left. Just left him out the door. 
got in the car, drove off. And ever since then, he's been wandering around with this permanently confused look on his face, thinking he might still find her. She's like, oh, she's around there somewhere. I'm, I'm gonna find you, Jenny. That's his vibe, I reckon. Anyway, Jonathan Gullis, yes, he was a teacher originally. Um, then he became an MP. And now he's deputy chair of the Conservative Party, which is really just top notch stuff from Sunak, isn't it? Just proper elite tier leadership there. You know? Like, I imagine somebody phoning up Rishi Sunak and being like, Rish, Rish, hey, Rish, it's me, yeah, uh, we've lost Lee. I'm really sorry, I know, it's, it is a huge loss to the realm of political thought, it really is. And look, I know it's a shock, I know he was irreplaceable, was our Lee, but just, just hear me out here, Rish, alright, just hear me, just, Rishi, Rishi, stop crying, stop, stop it, I said, stop, pull yourself together, man. I have an idea, okay? Because look, listen, right? If we look at the core components of what Lee Anderson was, right? He was a northern guy, but he was also an idiot. And he appealed to our own, you know, Oxbridge, privately educated, gilded, uh, cliche, ignorant stereotype of what we think northern people are all like and all like. Uh despite the polling that says that actually they, they don't. Anyway, look, I was thinking Jonathan Gullis, right? Would tick a lot of those boxes, wouldn't he? And then old Rich would be like, oh, marvellous. Absolutely. Yeah, do, you mean, do you mean the guy that called some of his own constituents scumbags, scrotes and savages? Yeah, 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 the, the, the very same. You mean the, the one who suggested just putting asylum seekers into tents? Like, like pu putting refugees... Into tents, into a leaky three-man tent from Argos, Jonathan. Really? You, you mean the you mean the one that scoffed at missing asylum seeker children, saying they shouldn't have come here illegally? Then, oh, oh, that is that is very clever. I mean, is is it? Well, no, no. Obviously, not, none of it is clever. But but you're right. You know, he fits the bill precisely, doesn't he? He's got the charm. He's got the cheek. I am absolutely confident. That with the right encouragement, Jonathan Gullis is destined for the very top of the supply teacher waiting list. <laughs> anyway, what was the last thing I wanted to talk about today? Uh, last thing I wanted to bring up was uh, Donald Trump. Guys, good old Donny. Good old Donald Trump. Uh, why, why was I going to talk about him again? Um, oh, yes. Yes, I remember now. So, obviously, his court cases are, are heating up now. Uh, he's got the Stormy Daniels campaign finance one that's starting soon. Uh, but he's also got this fine, right? And the fine was reduced this week from $450 million to less than half of that. And coupled with that revision, if you like, he is now able or permitted to do business in New York State again, right? So, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? That he got to run a decades-long property scam and he just stamped his feet and cried about the repercussions of it for a little bit and then the court were like, well, you know, when you put it like that... <laughs> <laughs> That's all it takes, really? I mean, just imagine, guys. Just imagine if you could do that for anything. Just kick off a little bit and they remove the ban and they halve your fine. <laughs> like, like, honestly, I heard about this, this, uh, this adjustment, this update. Right, and I was straight on Twitter <laughs> trolling the court who <laughs> did it. And I was like, like, trolling. I was like, hey, yeah, I just heard the new rules. Does this mean, does this mean I can bid $100 against my $10,000 lewd conduct fine? 
and I'm no longer banned from the titty bar? Is that like, you know, because it's like, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, just stamp your feet, throw a tantrum, they halve the fine and remove the ban. You know, like, yeah, yeah, I went to the strip club and okay, I got a bit excited. I, I did some things that I think we all found embarrassing that we would all like to move on from. You know, the court fined me 10 grand. I said it was a witch hunt at a kangaroo court, but f fine, whatever. You fined me 10 grand, but I I I've just done my little tantrum and I've shed a few tears about it. I think we can all agree that my tears have an exchange rate of about three bucks to one. So I'll just cut you a check right now for the last 100 and can a motherfucker get a table dance already? Like that, that is basically what we're saying here. Like, the Trump cases, they just feel like they're falling one by one, don't they? Where's the accountability? Like, if he isn't claiming that he's got presidential immunity for things, then the cases, the other cases, they're just getting delayed. Or there's accusations that the lead prosecutor isn't fit to prosecute it or something, and... You know, that if they aren't getting delayed or, you know, there isn't a presidential immunity, then there's, there seems to be little prospect of jail time. And if he does get found liable for things in civil courts, then they just end up halving the bill or giving him his business license back. And Like, have you ever had any doubts, dear listeners, that rich people don't go to jail, right? We should just, like, from this moment on, we should just look back on these Trump cases. And we should be like, yeah, like, look at this guy. Here's a case study. Look at this guy. He was inciting riots where people died. He was running rackets for years. <laughs> even when, even when half the United States hated him and he was guilty of sin, still, he managed to shirk jail. You know? And of course, tragically, meanwhile, good, honest, broke people like Lawrence Fox are getting themselves in all kinds of trouble. Aren't they? You know, that, that poor, sweet, privately educated, rather alumni, acting dynasty petal. Lawrence Fox never stood a chance, did he? Never had a chance. And look, I, I don't want to, you know, constantly rip into Fox because it, honestly, like, it sounds like he's going through a really rough time at the moment. And, you know, it sounds like he's down to his last £47,000 and, uh, and he's struggling. And I honestly think that, you know, when, when someone is feeling the pinch, when they are broke and they're desperate, I really think the right thing to do in that scenario is to muster all of your compassion, all of your empathy, and tell him to stay in a tent. Uh. <laughs> Guys, that's it from me. Uh, do jump on the Patreon or indeed the YouTube community, very similar things. Uh, if you're in a position to join them, um, they start at like three pounds a month. So it's pretty cheap. I put out two shows a week and they always go out to Patreons and YouTube community people two days before everyone else. You also get access to our little uh, Discord chat. I'm in there most days, but also very importantly, in between my Friday night live show that I do on YouTube and just before I go on to Labour Social at nine o'clock, I'm in the Discord chat chatting with my followers um i also do skype one-to-ones i should probably mention that with my uh, with my patreon backers and youtube community people uh we've done in-person meetups a few drinks nights in london it's a good time man it's a fun little cult that we've started um if you're not in a position to join patreon or the youtube thing uh you know if you don't want to add another subscription to your outgoings that's fine totally understand it but if you do want to say thanks, just, you know, if you've particularly enjoyed an episode, there's the three dots at the, you know, on YouTube. You could tap that. You could drop me a little super thanks, a little tip to put in the tip jar. 
Um, big shouts to the Patreons. Their names are up on the screen right now. All of you are bloody miracles. But that's it from me for now. Uh, I'll be back on Friday night. Until next time, keep it booge. Hashtag Bimfluencer. And I am out this mother hubbard. Mm -hmm.